The stories we tell ourselves shape who we are as individuals and as a society. Today's guest is a novelist whose stories explore enduring themes about the use of violence to resist evil, the meaning of family, and tension between tradition and modernity. She's Padma Venkatraman, this week on Story in the Public Square. Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. So each week, we welcome talented storytellers and scholars to help us make sense of the big narrative shaping public life today. This week, we're joined by Padma Venkatraman, an oceanographer, formerly, an author whose novels capture the challenges of the modern world. Padma, thank you so much for being with us. It's an honor to be here. Thank so, you. So, uh, there's so much that we want to talk about, but I want to begin with the motto on your website. Stories are ships on which we sail oceans of imagination. So, yes, but explain to us the, where that came from for you. I think it's a way for me to try to reconcile my oceanography past with my uh, present full-time writing career. And I realized uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins University where I worked and you know, before that I was at William & Mary, and somewhere along the way I used to, I always loved telling stories, I used to write scientific stories for lay people in newspapers and magazines, and I realized that even scientists, when they speak, the best scientists who most effectively communicate messages are able to create a story. And when we understand even facts and concepts that are mathematical, I think in some ways we shape them into narrative. And I felt like I wanted to do other things than I had been doing that far, which was you know, using my stories to inform or to educate or to entertain. I wanted to evoke empathy. And fiction does that. Fiction evokes empathy. And to me, you know, this idea of fiction as sort of a, a ship that is sailing out on the ocean of your imagination so, so, brings those uh, two together. Tell us a little bit about sort of the, 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 your own movement from being a, a, a scientist, you know, an oceanographer, to deciding to, to dedicate your time to writing fiction full time. To me, being an oceanographer was something that I did because I was concerned about the environment and about the world. And I started to feel that people, when they change, they change not just because of information that they have, but also because they learn to be a little more compassionate. And I think through story, that happens. If you open, let's say, A Time to Dance, uh, or The Bridge Home, or Climbing the Stairs, you get transported into another culture. I grew up in India. I have all these different homes inside me, all these different experiences inside me that I wanted to share, not vicariously, but it, through a medium that makes you then immerse yourself inside someone else. You are, for a while, if you read The Bridge Home, you are homeless and hungry and on the streets in India. If you read A Time to Dance for a little while, you are a person who loves to dance and loses your leg and through that physical recovery process discovers your spirituality. I wanted to put human beings into those situations because I think then you become more compassionate, you break walls through books of fiction, and I think breaking walls is so much more powerful than building them. So you grew up in India. Was, yes. was reading and writing an important part of your childhood with these things that you loved to do or did they come to you later? It was certainly an important part of my childhood. Um, you know, like the kids in the bridge home, my childhood involved having a father who could be very abusive. And books were, for me, a way to enter other minds, to, to feel other lives, maybe. That said, there was also something that went on when I was reading books in India, which was that almost every book that I read in India was of a person who was white, 
often male heroes. None of them had the religious background that I had or the cultural background that I had. And, I th and so many of the classics have an element of racism involved in them or other kinds of isms. Mm. And I think part of why I write the stories that I write is because I feel very, it's very, very important for us to understand people who are different from us, who look different, who think differently, who have different belief systems, even if you don't agree with that character, even if you don't you know, necessarily like a character, what happens when you read is that you start to see from the inside. You see, wearing the lenses of their eyes, you breathe with them, you look from inside their soul. So, so growing up, when you were reading, I think you're referring to sort of the European white canon of, yes. of writing. But even as a, as a young person, you understood that there was a disconnect between that. And a lot of that literature, of course, is great. And the rest of the world, as it were. As a child, did you intuit that? Yes, in part because so much of the literature that I was exposed to it was literature that had inherent racism, often racism against India. So if you look at, for instance, mm. you know, I don't want to call too many books uh, up, but let's say The Secret Garden, which is a classic that was yeah. given to my daughter. I wrote about that in, you know, the Nerdy Book um, has, there's a blog called the Nerdy Book blog, and it's wonderful. And I talked about the, uh, the racism in classics like uh, The Secret Garden, because the protagonist of The Secret Garden is somebody who talks about people like me whom she calls black savages. She has these ideas about uh, so many things that are just not okay, and yet I'm expected to identify with her. There is a character with a disability. Disability means a lot to me because there's so many people in my family with disabilities. And that person is sort of, you know, it's a disability that's not a disability, that person is shoved away. Those kinds of things, when we read them, I think they become insidiously part of who we are, and that's not, um, necessarily the best thing. I'm not saying we have to keep these classics away. They're mm. wonderful in many ways. I am saying, though, we have to expand, and there's so much out there now. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right, of course. Yeah. I'm curious a little bit about uh, sort of the, so the, you know, you're a trained scientist, the, the, uh, you know, skilled in the use of the scientific method. When you write fiction, uh, is there a method that you use? Is the, do you know what the story you're going to tell before you finish writing? No, there isn't. Um, I think that characters come to me, and I like to say they haunt me first, and then they sort of possess me. And with every book, there's a bit of me in the book, or my own history, that I find a, a way that it sort of jives with or comes together with the characters on history. I mean, the bridge home, like I said, there's this aspect of of my own domestic situation when I was a child, but I was never, I, I was very poor growing up with my mother who was divorced, was very, very uh, unusual in India. I never knew another child with a divorced parents. And she struggled to make ends meet, but then she also uh, went out to help children who were in poverty. And so I came into contact with these other children who had stories that were gripping, stories that were so important and I think always, even though I was attracted to science and mathematics, I listened and I wrote because words were magical to me. The fact that the first time I saw writing, it makes sense to me, the fact that these little black marks on paper could transport you, uh, you know, and, and transform you, and make you speak to somebody whom you didn't know, make you go back in time, time travel, that was fascinating to Boy, me. I that's the heart of that's the heart of writing and storytelling. You use the phrase that that your books and I'm assuming your characters in the books, they haunt me, and then they possess me. I'm going to steal that just so you know. <laughs> but it's it's beautifully put and and wonderfully correct and accurate. And it leads me to a question: Do you in your dream life find inspiration? Do you wake up and and bring with you a dream, something that you've been thinking of? How does the dream world relate to your writing world? A topic I don't think we've ever gone into here on the, on the show, but it fascinates me. I think that uh, essentially, as I said in, in the beginning, I'm fascinated with a character, and often they're characters that I've either in some way met in my life, and then there's something that links me to them. But in, I listen, and then it feels like at some point, you know, my family is telling me to please send them away from the table because I feel like they're there in my thoughts. 
and then they take over my dreams for sure. So that's how it usually happens, is first they're around, and then at some point I'm dreaming their dreams, and then it infuses my writing as so well. So you're seeing, you're seeing these characters in your dreams? Yes, and I'm sort of dreaming as them, if that makes sense. That's what I mean when I say I'm no, possessed. No, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I feel like it's not me, Padma, watching them as a film. It's, it's inside them. It's, I'm seeing through their minds. Uh, so we want to talk more about your fiction work, but I want to go back 10 years. The first yeah. two books that you published, uh, Double Stars, the story of Caroline Herschel, and women mathematicians. And one of the things that sort of strikes me when I hear you talk generally about your, your fiction work is that, I don't want to say that you're, you're mission driven, but you, you seem that like you have a clear <laughs> voice, right? You're, you're trying to open people's minds to other worlds, other realities that, yes. that surround us. In, in writing about women scientists, though, it also seems to me like there's, there's purpose behind that. Is that an uh, overstatement? You know, I don't know in a way that there is purpose, uh, and yet there is purpose. And I think when I was in oceanography school, it's certainly in the class that I came in, I was the only woman of color. And that was huge. And it meant a lot also because I was not only the only woman of color, I was miles away from home. I had no support network. And to be in that situation, I think, makes you understand what it feels like to be a minority, to be, and then at one point I was the uh, chief scientist of research vessels in Germany where everyone was uh, taller than me, spoke native German, which I didn't, and I was the boss. And I think it teaches you a lot about leading people that you don't look like. And um, certainly, I began sort of, you know, I called it on the side in the beginning when, when I was doing that sort of thing. And now I finally have a fellowship from the Hansa Wissenschaft uh, colleague in Germany where I'm invited to write my first adult novel and bring actually my science and my love of oceanography and numbers into my love of fiction. So I think hopefully with your blessings I'll get there. Well, that's very fulfilling. That, yes. must fit, that must feel good. So let's get into your fiction. Uh, your first two were Climbing the Stairs and Island's End. What were they about? Climbing the Stairs is set in India in the 1940s, and not a lot of people know that India had, at one point, the world's largest all-volunteer force in the Second World War on the Allied side, and one of my granduncles was part of that force. But I came from a family of nonviolence, so it was Gandhian, very much like the Quakers in this country. And so for this young man to say he wanted to serve was very different. And it's his story, but it's also seen through the eyes of my mother, who was a young woman at the time, a teenager, and she lived in a traditional house in which she was not allowed to climb the stairs to get to the library because women stayed downstairs where the kitchen was. And of course she did climb those stairs and I think she climbed them for me and my daughter, though she didn't know it at the time. Wow, wow. So that's what Climbing the Stairs is about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, powerful, what about Island's End? Island's End is, uh, you know, something that was loved by the critics and, and got starred reviews everywhere and all, of, all the other kind of uh, wonderful response that all my books have luckily, and I'm very grateful for, received, but it's not in print anymore, which is kind of sad, but it's about a young woman who uh, lives on these islands where, that I visited as an oceanographer. I'm not an anthropologist, but I live next to a tribe that looks very differently at the world. And we tend to think of indigenous people, unfortunately, which is so wrong, as primitive. And they, in, on this tribe, have women as leaders of their tribes, which uh, we haven't yet had in our country. And I think, or, you know, maybe we're not a tribe, we're a nation, but nevertheless. And I think, that was very important to me. The other thing to me that was so important and has always been a feature of my work is to explore different kinds of spirituality because um, on the islands as well, they have a very spiritual belief system that is different. In, in both of those books, if I'm not overstating this though, there's a, there's a tension between tradition and modernity. Yes. Right? Is, that, is that a theme that you're consciously playing with in both of those works? No, in fact, I hadn't thought about it until I came in here, but I think within me as well, there is that uh, bit of a tension between modernity and tradition. 
I obviously come from India. I grew up there. I was there for about 19 years, so it shaped me in some ways. I've been here now in this country longer than that, so that's also shaped me. And there's a tension there between two different, very different cultures sometimes, and also ways that we are all ultimately universal. We have our commonalities, and there are also these differences between the cultures that we need to celebrate. And how do I do that as a human being, as an author? And how does that tension then play out in my family as well? My husband is um, European and American, and my daughter then is all three. So, you know, how do, how do these things um, affect us as a family, as myself as an author? Certainly it plays a part in is, what I do. Is that a theme? The contemporary American situation that you've just described, is that a theme that you might explore in a book to come? Yes. Absolutely. And I think there's another thing that goes on when you talk about, you know, tradi tradition and modernity that I hadn't really thought of until now, which is that science, for the, uh, the way that we think of science now, is certainly modern, but spirituality is something that is a very old thing. And I think it's important to me that we explore and understand and really accept different kinds of spiritual belief systems, even if they're atheistic or agnostic, because I think these days, I hope, we realize that it's not right to just uh, rule against someone because of the body they're in. But we still, unfortunately, indulge in, I think, exclusivist rhetoric and elitist rhetoric based on religious preference, and I wish we were to use that word, religious preference, and I wish we were to stop being religiousist. I know that's not a word, that's my word, but I wish it were in the dictionary. <laughs> it's a good word, we're because, gonna make it a word. Yeah, because I think that, you know, we get to be a little religiousist sometimes, and well, that's cer something that plays in, into my books too. Certainly in 2018 in America, we're, we're seeing that played out in many different places and in, in narratives in, in the American experience currently. Where do you, where do you find, where, well, I'm just gonna ask the question, where do yeah. you find the inspiration for, for any of these stories? Is it, is, it, is it something that you feel compelled, is it a story that you feel compelled to tell? Where, where, do, where do they come from? It's a character, I think, that I feel uh, compelled by. I was once bitten by a snake and I nearly lost my life, and you know that experience was very, very painful. But it was also something that crystallized my sense of spirituality. I almost, at that point, lost a leg, and so I think that somehow came together in a time to dance in the story of this young woman who, who actually does lose her leg, and who evolves spiritually. You know, with the bridge home again, the stories that I hear, the people—it's a conglomerate of all these children that I knew growing up who were able to laugh in circumstances which were horrific and tragic. And I think I pull from them, but then they become one character in my mind, and that character haunts me, and, and there you are. So I think there's that element of, of both. So let's go back for a second to A Time to Dance, which yes. you just mentioned. That was published in, <coughs> excuse me, in 2014. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book? It got rave reviews, it sold really well. But yes. tell us a little bit more about it. It, it is <clears throat> uh, the story of a young woman um, who loses her leg. And l first of all, she loves, loves, loves dancing, so she wants to dance again. And that's her primary motive. But as she does that, dance starts <clears throat> to mean something else to her. In India, Bharatanatyam, which was the ancient dance form, was supposed to be a way to connect with the other, if you will. Uh, within us or within uh, outside of us, whichever way you want to define that. And that's what dance starts to mean to her. So she does continue to dance, but it's in a different way. The Bridge Home is coming out in February. Yes. So we're excited to have that come out and hear about it now. Tell us more about The Bridge Home. The Bridge Home is about uh, two children who run away from home because of domestic abuse and find themselves homeless on the streets of India and they find two other friends, and the four of them then bind together, and there's a lot of really horrible things that happen to them, but through it all, they laugh. It's the first one of my books, I think, where there's humor in the book, and that was incredibly important to me because I knew these children, and they laughed, and 
it's about that. It's also the spirituality plays into it as well because you have children in there, two of whom, because of this horrific experience, become atheistic and agnostic, and there's one who becomes deeply Christian. And I think the thing that I love about books is that you can have characters, and if you give equal weight to them, then you allow them to coexist, and they're all respected, and they're all able to be there on the stage That's with you. Um, you told us uh, uh, off camera that uh, one of the reasons you became a U.S. citizen was because of public libraries. <laughs> so, so tell us about the meaning of or the the power of public libraries for you. I, it's true. I walked into a public library in Yorktown, Virginia, when I first came in, and you know that time and that place. I went through a lot of racist experiences, which is not to say that that doesn't happen you know, in Rhode Island where I live with my daughter has experienced racism really? in her uh, childhood already, which has strengthened her and made her more compassionate, so I'm happy for that. But I wish she didn't have to be compassionate yeah. because of that experience. Yeah. But um, anyway, I, when I walked into public libraries, I thought about, I think the best part of our democracy is that, that you can have the magic of a book accessible to you. And I know there are so many different ways of storytelling, but a book is the only medium to me that absolutely respects your individuality. You know, if you and, um, you know, both of you, sorry, Wayne and Jim read The Bridge Home or A Time to Dance or Climbing the Stairs, each of you pick up that book, but you are two different directors, and you are co-directing the script that I have written completely in different ways. You have a movie in each of your minds which is different. And that's because I think a book, a story, a fiction story, allows me to say in what I don't say. It says, come in and collaborate with me. Let's produce this thing together. And I think that's where a book's power is. It's in what I say, but it's also in what I don't say, which is the space where we meet as souls. And, 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 and so the experience, though, with public libraries is different in the United States than other places you've yes. been? Yes. In India, we didn't have public libraries. Yeah. I know children who didn't have books. And, and you know, when I was in Germany as well, very recently, I did workshops at an asylum seekers center with refugee children. and. You know, you see how much they crave books. And here, when you have a public library, and I hope everybody who has a public library values that and keeps that going, because it's a place to access not just books, all sorts of things, but of course, I'll speak about books because I love them so much. <laughs> but it is, that is democracy, where anyone can walk in and free of charge be allowed to access the entire gamut of human experience, the entire gamut of human emotion. That's wonderful to and, me. And you know, even beyond the reading experience, which of course is the, the cornerstone and foundation of a public library, there, there's a social element, there's a meeting yes. element. It, it's yes. one of the few places where people of diverse backgrounds, races, identities, cultures, right. economic, economic status, go mingle with right. rarely ever a problem, Right. ever. People get along in libraries. Yes, and you know, you don't find that in other places. I've been to so many other, I've lived in other countries, right? I've lived in England, I've lived in Germany, um, in India, in the United Arab Emirates, very different places. Talk to us about the power of reading. I think the power of reading is in part this uh, aspect of, of being able to value your freedom. It's in part the ability of a book to transport you anywhere. Not everyone can buy a ticket to go to, you know, India or any other place that you want to go. No one can time travel, and a book makes you do that. And, you know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, these days uh, people are distracted, you know, kids especially are distracted by all sorts of things, and I think there's a book called the Book Whisperer by this woman, Donalyn Miller, in which she talks about there is a book in every child. And after my experience in the Asylum Seeker Center, if nothing else, I believe that. And I think you have to hook yourself to books first. Yeah. If you are, you know, with a phone in your hand telling someone to read, that's not going to happen. Right. But you hook yourself to books, you love books, you bring, allow books to be part of your conversation 
at the dinner table and don't make kids do book reports with all due respect I think <laughs> you know? well you've just kind of talked off a bunch of teachers but no, I, I, haven't. I, 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 mean, I hear I think what you're saying no, I'm joking I'm, yeah of course. I mean, there's so many teachers who are doing wonderful things yes so, of course you know, there's uh, there's this global read, al read aloud program that I you know wanted to give a shout out to because this woman Pernille Rip brings a book and then connects with teachers across the world. She's reading that book with her in her classes and classes across America and all over the world. And you know, there's so many efforts now to to connect using books that teachers and librarians have used, you know. We need diverse books as a fantastic movement. There's um, uh, YA Wednesdays, which is lovely. There's the pragmatic mom who is fantastic. I mean, there's so many people so many books, so many movements created by teachers and librarians. I love them. All good, all good. We have just a couple of seconds left. We always talk craft here. Where do you write? When? Do you go off in, in a room by yourself? Seconds. Twenty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I write whenever I can, wherever I can. I'm a mom. I have a, a ten-year-old daughter. I scribble uh, all the time, and even when I'm not able to write, I try to write in my head and connect that way with my characters and my story. Well, uh, we're glad you do. Uh, thank we you so sure much are. for being thank with us. You. She's Padma Venkataraman. Uh, the book, the new book coming out this uh, February is The Bridge Home. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about story in the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutus, asking you to join us again next time for more story in the public square.